States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, can I have a motion to waive the reading and accept the minutes for the uh, April 20th meeting? So Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, we do have three additional sheets of agenda items that we should all have in front of you. I have a motion to um, accept the Treasury report for March 2020. Second. Sorry. Any questions on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And our next meeting will be scheduled for next Tuesday, May 19th at 6 o'clock. Budget hearing will be May 26th. And the annual budget vote and election will be held on June 9th at the Institute ballot. From there, we'll move right into the superintendent's report. Matt? So you do have um, a slide deck packet in front of you. You won't be projecting. And then for the people that are watching at home, we'll We'll post this slide slide deck as a separate link. Wanted to um, celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week. The first slide you have there, um, a lot of great work going on each week by our um, by our student councils, um, some staff, and then certainly the teacher appreciation um, component. We had we had a lot of students um, sharing a lot of really great um, thoughts with our teachers. Uh, the second page is a I asked the community through a thought exchange to um, share with me um, appreciations for our teachers. And so you have some both some visuals there as well as some text around um, how appreciative everyone is. Um, it's been quite an uh, interesting time for teachers to move their classroom in a fairly quick fashion into a digital way and really proud of their work to stay connected with kids and stay connected with families and support families. I think there's always room to improve and there's always some things that we, the feedback we get to be addressed, but by and large, the feedback that continues to come in is um, how well, in spite of everything, things are working. I want to echo that and make sure I share that with you um, for sure. A few other celebrations and acknowledgements um, to put in there too is the class of 2020. Uh, we got senior spot, spotlights starting to roll out, so there's a lot of questions seen my updates to families or, or to staff um, a lot of questions about what are we going to do with seniors and i get that i get i get the the angst that's part of that question i also know that if you think of the national picture there's a lot in social media about graduation right now because there's a number of the states that they're in the middle of graduation and so we're trying to make sure that we're doing what we can to celebrate seniors and acknowledge seniors now but also knowing we're going to need a couple more weeks to get more and more guidance was on a conference call on Friday um, where it was pretty clear that we needed to still wait to get more information from state ed and from the governor's office about what's going to be permissible. Um, I think more will come into uh, picture I think within the next few weeks. Um, right, The news conference today indicated that uh, the Finger Lakes region, the Ro Rochester general region that we work ourselves out of, right, is going to open up next week and start that phase process. Um, so I think as that starts unfolding in the next few weeks, we'll make sure that we, we can figure that out. I think everybody wants to have some form of in-person event, um, and we also want to be able to do that under public health recommendations um, and any kind of executive orders that are there. So we're going to keep doing as much as we can to support our seniors, to acknowledge our seniors um, and all of our students, but wanted to make sure you knew they're just finding that balance of waiting for some information and I know it's we'd all like to know the answers yesterday and I'm included in that I'd like to know what we what we're allowed to do um, but that's not coming just yet so uh, this is Delorum had created a song so if you haven't checked the website or you didn't see that come through any of your emails um, really proud of what she did there it's a good good thing a lot of people enjoyed that so thanks to Mrs. Delorum for creating a sing-along for us of COVID-19 Next big news, if you didn't catch it, was that we're going to do a reverse light parade. And so how this came about was certainly we've seen news stories of other communities that did parades where staff went out to those communities. Um, we, you know, we wanted to do that too, but we started creatively problem solving some of our issues here that are a little different than some of the ones you might have seen on the news. 
right? We have 108 square miles. Uh, we have a lot of different kinds of roads and areas um, in all of the communities that we represent. And so um, we thought that one way, a better way to do it for us in our geography was to host it here and do a light, uh, this uh, reverse light parade. And so Casey and John, Station Lampier is um, a teacher who had the idea um, to, to do a parade. And so what's been nice about all of our problem solving over the, the last number of weeks is a number of active teachers and teacher leaders um, are working side by side with our administrators to creatively problem solve and to do what works best for us. Um, and so that's been really nice to see. It's been something that um, I'm not surprised that we would be doing, but it's definitely something I want to make sure I celebrate publicly here with you. It's been, it's been a really great team effort with a lot of different people involved and um, just really, really great to see. So that will be the Friday before Memorial Day, the rain date on that Saturday, so we're looking forward to that. Want to share now some, some learning updates with you of where we stand with things. And so in our incident command system, process we are approaching the end of phase three weeks four through nine phase three was about making sure that we got the google classrooms moving and got people logged into the google classrooms and did activities and learning experiences in the google and, and had each classroom really kind of test out the things that were working for them and the things that weren't um, and then as we move into phase four uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in more detail in just a few minutes but phase four will be this competency-based learning to um, certify what local credit looks like for the remainder of the year. And so we'll get into more detail. So things are going pretty well. Phase five would be when we reopen. I don't have any information on when that's gonna be. Um, if uh, things start moving as it seems, as far as the Rochester region and the Finger Lakes um, economic development area opening up uh, next week, then there's four stages that the governor had put out for, for kind of reopening. And schools come in the, in the fourth stage of that. And so I don't have any specific information that each one of those are 14 days, but that I would think would be the minimum because there's a lot of intervals of the 14 days. So if you just take those four stages and go to 14 days, we're mid July before, before we kind of get into, into that. So um, we're preparing summer school to be at least blended, if not somewhat remote, with some, time, some kind of contact stuff in there. We, we assume that we'll be here in, in September, um, but again, it's the whole Finger Lakes region on the map as we look at these things. And so um, if anything were to occur in August in any part of our region that, that spiked health concerns, we might get shut down too, um, not just in our county, but in that whole, um, whole Finger Lakes region. So it's still day by, it's, it's maybe not quite day by day anymore, but it's definitely week by week. Um, and maybe somewhere in between day by day and week by week that we know things and we can plan things. Um, so. Um, but throughout, as you see in your deck, uh, slide deck, you know, can't be more bulldog proud than, than, than possible. I mean, just a lot of really great things going on out there. Um, kids are doing, students are doing wonderful things. They're helping each other. Our teachers are out there, our administrators, and it's just been, been a really great effort to, to watch and see people be engaged and, and supportive and keeping the people first um, models that, that we started with so, so near and dear to where we're headed. So it's been great to watch. Throughout the learning, we've been um, right with kind of three big principles of that is what we do for one, we do for all. And so again, that, that fit even into the parade, um, trying to think through like, are we really gonna hit every single road of 108 square miles or do we try to find something that more people or as many people can come and participate here. Um, that human connection trumps the digital connection. Wanted to make sure that even though we're in a digital world, it's still about connecting with people through you know, emails and the streams and the videos and the conference calls. And so a lot of that's going on each and every day. It's just really, really been great. And then you know, working through that student well-being is far greater than academic well-being during this time frame. That doesn't mean we're not having learning experiences. That doesn't mean that we're not, um, right? Today was the first day of AP exams. So it doesn't mean that academics is not going on out there, but um, trying to really make sure that all of us would be very mindful that every family and every student is going through this in very different ways. Um, and some days are better than others and some weeks are better than others. And, and we just need to be patient and supportive um, and we'll all make our way through that. That certainly connects to the home learning standards, which I know you've seen before, but I just wanna make sure they're part of our consistent reminder because they are each time I update families that we've transitioned where learning's happening to home. And so we've got to um, be supportive and we've got to think through with them. 
that the decisions they're making to support their students at home are the right decisions. And I know those are guided by love, support, stability, and flexibility. And you know, within that, even my own home when I get home at night, right, and talking with my wife around what they did during the day, was that enough? Or my little pre-K girl, right, is she going to develop language quick enough? And the concerns that are happening in everybody's homes of um, of those type of things. I think we, we all just got to be patient and know that if if the focus stays with love, support, stability, and flexibility, that we'll get through this. We'll come out the other end and pick it up wherever it is and keep moving things forward for sure in September and, and in the months to come. Also wanted to include for you um, a quick couple uh, feedback results. As I mentioned, we continue in all the thought exchanges that we are doing to get really good positive feedback. Um, there's also feedback for growth and feedback that we're improving on things. We really appreciate that. Um, but a lot of good thank yous um, from this community engagement that came in from Thought Exchange. Um, and, you know, just really appreciate um, the mutual, I think, gratitude that's within our community now. Again, there's always things to improve on, and, and we want that feedback to improve on it. But things, um, things are going pretty well, and, and that's great to, great to hear and great to get that feedback in when we're doing those Thought Exchanges. Last couple slides in this section before I get to budget stuff of just learning and where we are is moving into phase four. And so what you see in your in your packet as you keep moving through it is that phase four is the competencies and the idea is what can what do kids know, show, and be, um, and where our folks have been working um, in the buildings is to move through the three steps that are outlined that we outlined when we started this was prioritizing learning standards, bundling them into competencies of what kids should know, show, and do, um, and then figuring out um, ways that they can demonstrate that in the new digital environment. What we, we're really optimistic and hope that what it's gonna do for all of our families and students is um, focus, attention, and energy. Um, we see a, a number of, I'm really proud of, I mean, our second and middle high school are working on uh, interdisciplinary, um, standards and so looking at how um, writing and thinking and, and, and problem solving is in multiple standards across different content areas and so I think what we'll end up seeing and be able to share with you by next week is even at the high school level having just about five maybe six competencies to focus on from May 18th to the end of the year and not um, five or six per class or not five or six right but just five or six and just finish strong, do what we can, support the heck out of that, and have kids be working through that. It's a pretty big investment in a different way of, of thinking about it. There's a number of states that do it. Um, we're a little bit uh, behind that in New York State as far as competencies and trying to make that switch. Um, but I do think it's a really positive investment because I hope that we'll never be in this situation again of an extended period away from school. But I gotta say that I have to at least prepare if we were. Right, because there is at least some public health suggestion that that may or may not happen as we move forward. And so um, investing in, in this kind of approach, I think would is gonna make us better off if we were to have to go out next year. Um, we'll just turn on the competencies and turn on the Google Classrooms and we'll be in a much better place than uh, we were as it came in early March. The last two slides as far as learning goes with what, what does the end of the year look like are ones you've seen before as well. And I just wanna bring them up as a reminder that we, what we've done is try to approach where we were before March 13th, which are in the middle high school, um, right, a numeric 100 point system. And so the matrix that is um, there on that sheet has on the left side, being able to get a numeric point of where students were before they left, and then use competencies and how many competencies have been accomplished for the rest of the year to get a, um, a, a sense of where they're gonna be as far as earning local credit. Um, and so what you see is failure review components if students aren't pursuing their competencies in the way that we'd like them to be doing. And so there will be conversations about whether or not they should be granted vocal credit and those type of things. Um, it doesn't say just fail though. I want to be very clear to you and to anybody watching or recording this. It is failure review or grade level advancement review, whichever you're looking at the different development. So there's going to be a conversation about that because every family has different challenges and every family is going through different things. And it won't be just as simple as the student wasn't able to accomplish as many competencies as they, 
as maybe we'd like them to do. And so it won't just be, it's not binary, it's not going to be an on off switch. There will be a conversation with administrators and teachers and families and students, right? Developmentally appropriate at the different levels to say, okay, if you weren't able to do those competencies, why? And, and we're checking along the way to be supportive of that as we get into it. We've had some conversations about that at our team meeting today. Um, so I think it's the best approach to, again, focus kind of energies on learning to a few really important things to close the year out and make sure we're as fair and equitable as we can be with um, establishing local credit. So before I switch into kind of a budget overview, that's the that's what we've been working on. That's uh, that's our that's our learning and our um, support kind of systems. Anything I can answer or questions or any thoughts about any of that stuff. So the AP kids will AP be their competency basically. So those classes have always done things after their AP, and so they will have they will still have competencies in addition to their AP, especially because they're. Um, multidisciplinary so it's not just one um, one content area they're going to be like humanities so uh, English and social studies are teaming up and STEM science and math and technology are teaming up so you can't just write it up on one content because it'll be merged and the design around that was to help kids have less um, to focus on if you finish by the end of the week. Thank you for asking. Anything else? <coughs> Right, that was good stuff, that's fun stuff, that's, you know, challenging, stressful and all, but um, the, the, the next segment is to give you a budget overview um, before our budget workshop. So typically we would have an overview similar to this, I guess, in a February type meeting, right? And then we would come to the March workshop um, through the executive order. They've condensed that timeline, and so we have to get things ready for a June 9th budget vote, which means we're looking to have our workshop as indicated on your agenda next Tuesday night. Um, and so I want to just give you, um, we've gone over some of this, so I want to just give you a reminder because it's a lot to digest in a week. Um, and so I want to make sure we just go through that uh, again. For this fiscal year, we're still on track to be getting our state aid payments. We're still on track to being able to employ everybody. We're still on track, but we're still monitoring it. Um, there is very little information coming out all of you right now about finances. Um, that's not a, that's not meant to be a, I wouldn't interpret that in a good or a bad way. It's just a statement of fact. There's very little information coming out. Um, that's pretty typical. Actually, if you look historically around when decisions are being made, so um, often there's positioning and information coming out of Albany in um, you know, in March, early March, around the budget, and then as you got close to April 1st when it was actually due, like there was, there was a lot of quiet on the Western Front, um, so to speak, in those last, you know, last few days to, to do it. So don't, don't read that as a bad thing or a good thing. I just, just said we're, we're going to have to keep monitoring it. We hope that um, state aid payments are not delayed or withheld, um, but again, we're week to week, maybe day to day on some of these things, and so we're good so far, and we'll continue to be as good as until we hear different from the state. So we're marching ahead. Um, for next year's budget, I got a couple slides in there, right, that just remind you of the process we normally have. And I think it's important um, for you and, and anybody who watches this to, to understand that we usually do this over the course of a few months, and we've been asked to do it now over the course of a few weeks. So um, I do know it's a lot to, to process, a lot to digest. Please, please know that. Um, long days throughout the weekend too on our end to try to figure out to get the best documents and information for you. Um, so, so we're doing our best to work through it and get you what you need. Um, but when we left on March 13th, right, we, we had, we were about ready to have that budget workshop. We were in a place where we were about ready to recommend some tier one cuts, which we called at that time tier one and tier two cuts. Um, we had talked to the individuals that would have been impacted by the tier two cuts um, before we came to you. We've done that on that Friday the 13th. Um, and so all that, as you see the X through it, right, is, is pretty much out the window and we had to reset and have to recalibrate. And so since then through April, there's some just reminder information that there have been very strong um, signals from the state in those weekly or daily briefings that uh, we need to prepare ourselves for a 20% reduction. And that, um, whether that be the budget director that you have in one of your slides or the governor himself, 
um, that, you know, that it was very likely to make sure we were prepared. Um, one of the governor's comments, if you remember through the process was, what was his advice to schools? And it was, well, I can't help schools. I can't keep reality from schools or something to that effect. Um, so, you know, we are working on it. We are preparing it. Some of that reality, as well as I included for you, is some of the unemployment figures, right, within our region, across the country. I mean, in our region, there's a 1,199% increase in unemployment as of May 1st. Um, so I know that's not brand news because, right, if you just catch any kind of news story, you know that the economic situation is um, of concern for a number of people in our community and beyond. And I want you to know that we're thinking about that as we talk with our unions about their contracts, we're, we're expressing that to them as well, um, that we have to all be thinking about um, where we are now and, and the impacts across our community. Um, and so please know that you know, we're sharing that. We have that in consideration. I know a number of you do as well. The federal government, um, we'll see, right? I, I do believe a full bailout that would require no cuts by us would be a Hail Mary pass, would be kind of one for the ages, right? Um, what I included for you is a, an Ed Week article, or sorry, US News and World Report article that cites um, uh, CEO of Alibu, which is an ed tech um, financial company. And I think what I highlighted there, I think it just brings it really home that we're, we're almost, as she said, Jess Gardner said, we're almost certainly going to be asking school districts to do more with less. They have been for over a decade, but they're definitely across the country. They're looking at 15 to 30 percent budget cuts, right? Our governor has been signaling 20. Um, and I, you know, I agree with what I also highlighted for you is um, it's just an impossible situation. So as we move through it in the next week with our staff, with our administrators and with you next week at the um, there is no good decision that we're recommending, right? We, we've been through this, unfortunately, and we've been on this, um, this uh, gerbil wheel, so to speak, I guess, um, for over a decade as a very tight and fiscally responsible district. And so um, I know I get in conversations sometimes when I'm working with staff and there's, I get it, I get it from a, um, a humanistic standpoint that, that there's a choice in recommending some of these things Right, and I just have to work through them. That that while there are always choices in the world, our our choice field isn't the ideal choice field. Our choice field is what's the least harm, right? Our choice field is how can we figure it out with the least impact on student programs and opportunities. Um, and that's I wish it was different, is what I shared in my in my staff update this morning. That I know sometimes I just get there because I got to solve the problem. My responsibility is to work with people to solve the problem. And so I'm just there and maybe I'm always in it that people don't always hear from me enough that I wish it was different. I wish we, we didn't have those problems. I wish we could um, just take money out of reserves and, and dump them into the saving program and stuff. But um, the realities are just different for us and, and we're going to deal with them like we do every year in the most positive and productive way. That respect kid, um, kids and staff and our community and um, you know unfortunately we're, we've gotten fairly good at it and so um, even though it's a short time frame we've got a we got a process that we can continue through so specific to some budget numbers and some budget thoughts um, as I shared with you last meeting um, we we've scoped out the what where we think a what a six percent cut would really impact us and so. Um, the pandemic state aid cut that initially was enacted as the April 1st budget was 208970 That was offset by federal stimulus, so that's another reason why I'm not really counting um, on all the, on any kind of really direct federal stimulus. Very often it comes to the state and they just don't give us the money. Um, so I guess it saves on, I don't know, electronic transfers, but the reality is there's a lot of intercept that happens when federal stimulus comes into our state. Um, and so we're at the mercy of whatever they decide. Uh, we then, there's a cut at the end of April 30th, a cut at the end of June 30th, and a cut at the end of December 31st. We've plugged into the budget numbers preliminary, preliminarily for you to get a sense of where we are with 6% reduction, that we roll that 2000 or 208,970 over into those cuts. We do not have any specific number at this point in time of what those cuts will be. 
And in fact, if we go with a 20% number, it would be much bigger, right? So those, those three buckets of 208,000, that represents 6%. So it would be three times that amount if it really comes into 20%. But we, you know, I think 6% is, a, is certainly a fair place to start. And we've been working the problem as if it was 20%. And we'll be able to share by next week a lot of different information about what does that mean in between the 6% and the 20% so that we're prepared and ready. Um, and it's a moving target because there could be either additional cuts beyond the 20% that comes in December. There could be additional cuts that come in June. So there could be additional cuts after we set the appropriations plan. So even if we kind of figure it out here in the next week, there's no guarantees that we're out of the woods with what that may mean down the road. Um, so um, again, I started with the learning and all the good stuff that's happening first intentionally because um, I, I needed it today to, to be there because we've been in budget quite a bit um, but there's a lot of a lot of budget things there's some other variable budget items that change based on um, things that we weren't spending on so it's not just a good thing they're not spending on it we get right sometimes 70 percent um, return on expenses um, and so not you know transportation is a big one not rolling the buses right yeah you save on gas and you save on those things at the same time, you're not getting transportation aid, and so we had to pull that out of the appropriations plan. So those variable expenses, um, Jeremy's done a great job of nailing those things down. Uh, we mentioned the TRS and ERS numbers make us a little nervous too, because those are only suggestions or um, pro projections, I think is exactly what they call them, right? Um, but their boards don't meet until the end of the summer and into September. And so based on how the market's doing at that point in time, you know, very well they could do some adjustments that are beyond what we're budgeting for. And so we've made sure we've gone to the high part of their projections, and that's where the adjustment of 167, 319 comes um, from. But, you know, it, it could change in August and in September as well when, when their boards meet and look at um, look at what where the finances are. And so if they, if they change... If they change their projections in September, what they mean, that affects next this following school year. Oh, okay. 20, <coughs> the 2021, 2021 school year. 2021. So when, when they set rates, they're setting rates for the 2021 school year based off of prior year salaries. But it's, the rate is for the current year. Yep. So they give us a range starting in about February. They'll tell us the range could be potentially between this number and this number. So when we do the first rollover budget, we go with the high number. And then somewhere later in the spring, usually they come back and say, market's doing okay. We expect the, that projection is gonna be at the lower end of that range. So this year it's like 95 to 10 to was the range for TRS. And then later they came back and said, it's gonna be about 953. That's our projection of what it will be. But it still involves current year market returns. So at that point, their analysts were still figuring on strong market returns for this year. And so, this year not having good returns could result in that current year projection yes. Some we'll keep our eye on and could impact us in a negative way in the middle of this budget appropriations plan. And then the, the last column there that you have um, is the allowable tax cap under right the regulations is 2.6%. Um, There's some additional decimals after that, but generally it's 2.6%. Um, and so Right, there's some decisions that need to be made there um, uh, from the board and we'll continue to find more, to get you more information um, throughout the week and into next week's budget workshop so that we can make the appropriate decisions there. Next um, slide is, is just to drill in a little bit more on that, right, and to highlight kind of where, where does that put us with the current, um, current gap. Um, and so, um, the current gap with tier one cuts included from March 13th is 1.6 million if you have a 6% pandemic cut. And so what we're working on and what we'll make sure that you have uh, more information about is then those next levels created some new levels. So I couldn't call them tiers because we're used to tiers. So now it's a whole different, we have, we have tiers from before and now we're gonna have levels, right? From really stinks, but gotta happen, level one all the way down to level six of absolutely last resort. Um, and so working with the admin team, working with our staff, um, working with the admin team, and um, we're putting together, um, basically that's $3 million of cuts. So each, each level is gonna be equivalent to $500,000. And 
And so we'll continue to work through that. Um, what that does for us is it prepares us for if it is a 6%, but also prepares us if it's a 20% um, where we're gonna be, because much like the decision to have a June um, 9th vote came out at 445 on a Friday afternoon, um, I can't promise that a certain date at a certain time, <laughs> we're gonna get information about what the cut is. And so what we're trying to do is make sure we've got lots of contingency, lots of information, lots of decisions ahead of, ahead of schedule um, if it comes in. Um, so last um, couple slides here before we close out the budget section in my report is I included one around the reserves, um, which I've shared with staff before. Um, what it does is take all the total reserves for schools um, and then just kind of shows you that nice little curve and I've taken a nice arrow there to let you know where we are with our reserves relative to the whole state. Um, I advocate regularly. It's not necessarily a um, topic that a lot of people want to talk about, right? Because it has different implications for different school districts if they talk about it. It's not something that um, a statewide organization will necessarily pick up to carry the charge at because they often represent um, school districts that are on both sides of this curve that you're looking at. Um, but I still, I still advocate and still say that true equity, true fairness, true need is also based on what you got in your bank account. And so yes, there may be other places that have um, maybe some lower socioeconomic status indicators, which are need to be supported with equity calls too. But we played by the rules forever. We have always been in that small portion of districts that um, only, um, only tax what they absolutely needed to in any one of those years. We've been extremely fiscally responsible for over three decades. And as a result, what that means is we just don't carry a large balance in our savings accounts, those, those reserve funds. Many of them are restricted, and so they can't just be used in times like this. But the ones that um, I would just argue that the ones that you see towards the right of that graph um, uh, likely have some reserves that are not as restricted. The reserves we have are very specific and small to cover um, as many liabilities that we might have in those different categories that we have. And Jeremy's shared with you before the reserve plans and um, you know, we're moving some things around tonight in the agenda as well around those things and so, but. By and large, I think, I also want to bring it up and I've shared it with staff is, there's going to be some districts that people hear about or know about that aren't struggling as much right now with their budgets. <coughs> and I can't tell you with certainty because I, I don't want to do too much of an overgeneralization, but I, my first hunch, if somebody comes to me and says, District X has already solved their budget and aren't going to impact any programs or kids, my first question is going to be, what did they do with reserves? And most likely I'm not going to get an answer from that person because that's not what's going to get covered in any news story. And that's fair and I get how that works. But if I went to that district, I'd probably be able to track down some board meetings where they took excess reserves that were unrestricted and, and put that into their budget and they're already done with their budget. They're not going to go through the level of detail that, that we need to go through and that we go through each and every year. And so, don't want to come across as complaining or whining or what was us, but I'm just, that's the reality, right? And I know that you get questions sometimes and I know we see news stories, right? Of some districts doing X, Y, or Z and, um, you know, not going to say in a public session, but I can, I can probably in a personal private conversation, give you some information about any one of those districts of, of where they might be on some of these things. So last, um, last slide before I close up here, is um, just general timeline. Okay, so May 11th, we're gonna do this general update, which I'm just getting done completing. We're in the process of contacting grade levels and departments and individuals um, for ideas and collaborative problem solving. We had a thought exchange that went out at the end of last week that just said, hey, everything's on the table um, in your locus of control and what you're working on, do you have any ideas? So a number of ideas came in some of them we're already doing, some of them are very specific to a department, and so I need to follow up with that department to talk about, okay, this was an idea that came through the thought exchange, can you live with it, can we do that, how would that work? And so that's, that's really this week in a lot of our work, 
That doesn't mean I'll talk to every teacher. That doesn't mean I'll talk to every grade level. That doesn't, I, there's just not enough time to do that. That's in our plan. That's what we would normally do. That's what we wanted to do if we were in a regular budget cycle in March. Um, but that's not, you know, in this compressed timeline. So we're going to get to as many people as we can targeted based on some feedback and some thoughts. May 15th, um, the New York State aid cut, question mark, question mark. We may have info. If I, when I was thinking about this yesterday, I would have said, yeah, I've gotten lots of signals that say we may have info. I received an email today from one of the state um, committees that I'm on um, that said we might not get info by the end of the week. So again, there's, no, there's not a lot of information coming out. Um, but if part of the way we structured this was if there were some more information, we would make sure we'd integrate that into um, how we're approaching things. Uh, moving into the May 19th meeting, we will make sure we contact any individuals privately and confidentially, right? That's always our process. We make sure we have those conversations um, with them about that their name might be on a priority cut list and that the board, you know, will be talking about, maybe talking about them in executive session on the night of the 19th. Uh, the other note is that we are creating a Google form process and want to point in your direction. You have a single piece of paper. I know you got a lot of paper tonight, so bear with us. We'll orient everybody to it, but um, a single piece of paper that has some red type on it. And so we do not need to change board policy um, to comply with this new virtual setting, but, but it is important to communicate to our community um, and make sure you understand what public input looks like in this new format. And so um, what you have there is what we will send out. But again, we are creating a Google form that will allow public comments to come in um, before the May 19th meeting and before the May 26th budget hearing. That'll come in, it'll get processed um, so that it'll be sent to me to categorize, maybe give some answers, make sure I integrate it into our reports and our work, and then work with Dave as the board president um, to um, figure out the best way to share that back in the next public session. Um, and so why, why I'm a little hesitant about promising that every single one will be read is, um, right, if, if we get a hundred form in there, we, we may not be able to read in public session every single one of them. And so there's just some decisions that, that Dave will make along those lines, uh, working with Diane as the clerk, um, and we'll take it. Um, we'll kind of take it from there. So just want to make sure you're aware of um, that the red is a change. Typically we have um, people can come and identify themselves to the district clerk and, and have a th up to three minutes of public time is what is normally on the back of our agendas, but in the virtual kind of world that we're doing, um, this is a slight change to make sure we can still get public feedback and comments and questions in our budget process in our future meetings, but just do it in a in a more manageable way with that. Um, so the budget hearing is uh, May 26th, that'll be pre-recorded. So any of those comments or questions that come in, we'll make sure we integrate those into um, the response and the reporting. Um, and then the budget vote is June 9th and that's all by mail. So I know I've spent a long time with that. I wanna make sure I give some time. Jeremy and I often integrate our presentations to definitely um, give them a flavor of the wonderfulness, which is figuring out how to do an all-mail vote. Um, I think they need to be aware of the things you and Diane have been working on um, based on that, but also anything else with the budget, please. Yeah, um, so vote by mail, last, is it last Friday now? Time's moving at a different pace right now. Uh, I think it was last Friday night about 4.45, the executive order came out that said this year's vote would be all by mail and mandated that we send a ballot and a postage paid return envelope to every qualified voter in the school district. So it was about 5.15 when I read the executive order and texted Matt real quick and said, do you have any clue how we know who the qualified voters are in our school district? And very quickly, it took about 24 hours for everybody in every school in New York State to realize we had a dilemma on our hands, which is we don't require registration for school votes. Some schools in the state do. I don't know how many, it's not many, but there are some schools that do. Any school can do voter registration. It's just another thing you would have to do that you don't have to do normally. So what does it mean to be qualified to vote? Uh, you have to be 18, you have, to have reside, you have to be a citizen of the United States, be 18 years of age, and have resided in the school district for at least 30 days and stop. So there's 
there's no one list that exists anywhere of who are the voters. So what we started kicking around different ideas and the one piece of guidance we got from legal counsel was make sure that you're being consistent with schools in your area so that everybody has some consistency within those school districts. So we worked with the Livingston County Board of Elections and all the schools in Livingston County to be consistent in our method. And what we all decided we would do is we would use the registered voter rolls from the Board of Elections for all the counties that serve our districts. We have a small portion in Ontario County um, as well as Livingston County. They provided us with all of their registered voter rolls for residents of the Livonia Central School District. We also use school tools. So we have any parents and we cross reference to ensure that the parents had in district addresses and we made sure we caught both parents if there were two parents in the household or guardians. We also pull, pulled students out of school tool because you have 18 year old students who are qualified voters but who have never registered to vote. So we added them to our list and then we went through sign in sheets from historic votes here in the district to see who had signed in before and had a legible name that we could read and write. Um, so then we consolidated that all into one database. Um, I then created a unique identifier for every person utilizing a certain unique data from each of their names and addresses and removed duplicates because there were lots of duplicates within that list. Um, and we're up to a little over 8,000 people who are qualified voters. I see some faces and smiles. That is certainly a whole lot more than ever vote in a school election. So a lot of folks will be receiving ballots who have never voted in a school, either budget or board election before. Um, so we are still finalizing our process. We have two paths that we're pursuing right now to complete the vote. vote. Um, and I'm waiting on some information back. There's some potential that we can use a, a private party through a BOCES to print and stuff for us. The other alternative is we've sourced a vendor who could print all these envelopes for us, provide them to us, and then we would stuff in-house. We're fortunate that we have the County Board of Elections in Livingston County is awesome. Um, if you talk to any friends who are on school boards in other counties, I'll just say that Livingston County is awesome. They will print our ballots for us. They, they will turn them around quickly. They will be awesome. They will scan for us. Just about anything we need, they will do at a more than reasonable rate, if there is any rate at cost for everything. That is not the case elsewhere in the state, and we are very fortunate. Um, having spent late nights on board vote nights in previous positions hand counting ballots, we are fortunate, and I can't express that enough, they're the best. Um, so depending on which option we pick, either we'll outsource the printing and stuffing, or we will do it ourselves with the county printing and the wee stuff, and then they will be mailed to every one of those 8,000 people. There will also be a postcard that goes in this week's penny saver that was a new mandatory postcard with the details of how the vote's working this year. It was mandatory in the executive order. So there's cost to print and get that into every penny saver this week. Then we also have the standard postcard that we have to do um, where we give the, the short form of the budget that we have to send out right before the vote. And then those ballots will be sent out. We have um, Diane's been tracking down some crazy things that we didn't even know existed. So you can get a postage permit that gets printed on the return envelopes such that you only get charged if they're scanned through in the post office. So we didn't know that existed before, but we were able to source that out. So that'll be on the return envelopes. So we'll only have to pay for the balance to get returned. We're also going to try to offer a drop off um, option that is staffed by the Board of Elections so you could drop off here that would one save on some postage and also give people the chance to get it in at the last minute because there is the requirement that it be in the building by five o'clock on election day. So if people forget to mail, we wanna make sure they have a, a drop off option as well. Um, so those are all the details we're working through to try to track this down and get it done. There was also, as I think everyone is aware, the change in requirement for Board of Education members. So there was no petition requirement and it was simply notification to the clerk by five o'clock today that you wanted to be on the ballot. They will go on the ballot in alphabetical order, and we have four candidates, four, four potential board candidates who submitted before five o'clock today who will then be on the ballot. Did I miss anything? Four additional? Four total. Four total. For the three, three open seats. seats. Okay. It, it, it's been fun. 
Yeah, did, do you guys get the, does everybody get the rural schools newsletter? Do we send, do you, do we send that to everybody, Diane, the electronically? Uh, did you guys get it this, couple, like last week? I don't think I get rural schools. There's a, there's a great letter in there, yeah. I'll Can make sure everybody gets it, yeah. all right? You want to get this. I'll make sure, Dave <laughs> and, and I will make sure everybody gets it. Take, take, take a second and read David Little's letter to the governor and it gives you a pretty good scope of, of the difficulty and what's really wrong with this budget preparation process and the voting process. There's, there's significant issues with it. That, that, to just uh, take a second to read it, but it's really good. Is any, uh, do we know of any, any large districts where, you know, I mean, I know even just Webster, they have like large, Four turnouts, right? Has anybody sued yet to try and stop the uh, the old uh, candidate just comes in with no signatures? Is is violation of the process? I have not seen okay. a suit. And, and the executive order was explicit that candidates don't have to have these petitions. Yeah. So that if there were a potential suit, it would be on that executive the legality of that executive order. Right. And I haven't seen anything. I think to that I'm like the you mentioned a, a very large school district in her area. I think they're also struggling too with the, the same dilemmas we are with both. So we have 8,000, I don't know right. how many they I'm candidates. more of like a board candidate on a large- uh, Yeah, right. You know, on something yeah. large, big money. Yeah, I have, have more seen. Mike, go ahead. We already have lawyers on the way. Yeah, I haven't seen any. But it's still those same requirements. 60% majority, super majority, all those. those with the vote coming in, that's all got to stay the same? So the 50% plus one vote was still what passes the budget, 60% if you're exceeding the cap. Right. All, all those rules stay in place. Yes. Oh, they all stay the same. Yeah. Is it major difference between 800 and 8,000 possible voters? <laughs> I, the thing I read today is, is still advocating hard that doesn't think they're going to get into place with the governor. So. so, right. I mean, when Dave and I have talked about, I, we continue to advocate, you know, NISCUS is a superintendent organization that the committee's on the house. Continue to advocate. We advocate against a lot of the provisions that were put in here. Um, but um, I think in the, in the climate that we're in, in the position that we're in, it's not, I don't, I don't see the governor making a, a, a sidestep. You know, I, I see the governor probably like he did with the MTA, saying, yeah, it's really hard to close the New York City, City subway down. But we did it, and we're gonna do it, because that's what you need to do right now, because it needs to get done. Now, I don't know the governor, I don't call him, I don't wanna like project that I'd have some inside. Uh, this is my read. My read is, right, is, are you kidding me? I closed down the subway, it's never been done before to make sure it's right, and you can't figure out a boat. I, I can see a conversation like that probably being had at some, in some room with some aides, right? So we're gonna do it, we're figuring it out. Appreciate all the hard work, Diane, Jerry. I mean, the, the amount of checking in and conference calls that we're all having and echoes at Livingston County has been just tremendous. I mean, the Department of Health has been great. Our county administrator has been doing a great job. Board of Elections, right, getting on the phone with all of us as superintendents. Been a really collaborative effort through the county, and that's um, that's really great to have. The only thing I'll add is that you do have tonight for approval uh, the new budget notice, the public notice for it. We did, if you recall, approve a more generic budget notice last time that we thought we'd just be able to fill in the blanks. However, that generic budget notice did not anticipate in all remote voting, uh, all by mail. So there were some legal requirements that we had to adjust with the so we got. Um, legal counsel to give it a look over to make sure that we still comply with all requirements, sp specifically because of the bonding of the buses. We always want to make sure that we work, uh, comply with all municipal law there, because complying with the public notice requirements allows us to sell the bonds for the buses as tax-exempt municipal bonds, and so the public notice has to be right. So there is an updated public notice. That concludes our reports. Yeah. We're getting questions for Matt or Jeremy on that stuff. Okay, um, now we're gonna. This is a little convoluted. I want to. Uh, I want to uh, have a motion to approve the consensus agenda up through 
um, O, um, an education personnel, up, up through I, right. up through I, not including O and beyond, um, with the exception of K, L, and M, which I'd like to read separately. So could I have a motion to approve the consensus agenda as presented um, A through I with the exception of K, L, and M? So moved. Second. Anybody have any questions on any of those? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, K. Uh, resolved to accept the resignation of Wayne Walder, an elementary education special education teacher for the purpose of retirement and in appreciation for his 26 years of dedicated service to the district, effective June 30th, 2020. So, second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? L. Resolved to accept the resignations of Martha Walder, an elementary education teacher for the purpose of retirement and appreciation for her 26 years of dedicated service to the district, effective June 30th, 2020. So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And N, resolved to accept the resignation of David Brango, special education teacher for the purpose of retirement and appreciation for 23 years of dedicated service to the district, effective June 20, 30th, 2020. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and at this time, I'd like the motion to uh, enter executive session for the purpose of discussing some uh, specific personnel matters. In contract. In contract. Contract negotiation. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 